have a central microphone here, and we would like, if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, uh, respond, could they come up uh, and preferably be fairly brief, because then everybody will get a go. Uh, um, my question is probably addressed to John Hurst and Henry Reynolds. Um, the current uh, asylum seekers in relation to the Sri Lankans strongly correlates to Tampa. Rudd's statements, um, recent statements last week in relation to having uh, a no apology approach on his hardline stance is very similar to Edmund Barton, which in 1901, I quote, he states in relation to the immigration restriction bill, I need make no apology for calling this one of the most important matter with regard to the future of Australia. Such statements represent a cultural anxiety of white Australia, something which I believe is ingrained with the wider Australian national consciousness. This cultural anxiety is not just about race, but in a more complex and profound way about space, the space of territory as Australia as a nation. As such, immigration has been viewed as fundamentally impl implicating a cultural integrity and political sovereignty of the nation. White Australia, from its inception as official policy, was a matter of national survival. Uh, do you think that this is true in a historical context and is cultural anxiety relating to race and space prevalent in Australian society today? Thank you. That's a very long question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the uh, parad paradox is that, as I remarked, we, we behave quite differently in relation to the Vietnamese. Now, I suspect one of the reasons for that is that the right wing in Australia felt obliged to accept refugees from communism. And that was very, very important. It didn't matter for whatever reason you left a communist state, you were accepted as a legitimate refugee. Now, that uh, disappears uh, after you know, the end of the Cold War. But the paradox is why ever on earth a country like Australia with a very, very large migration program, very diverse, as John has pointed out, um, one which has very, very large numbers of uh, illegals who are here because they flew in on visas and temporary visas, why is it that we are so distraught about arrivals by boat? Now, one of the answers is that it was clearly originally a political, purely political. I mean, I think the Tampa was political. Uh, it was found to be a useful thing, and I think now it is being used quite irresponsibly by the present opposition to quite deliberately uh, make this seem to be a great threat, which I don't think it is. Um, yes, I think there are some continuities, but some differences. Um, as I said in my paper, if you uh, look at the concern about border protection as an ind indication of cultural anxiety, then you are left, as I said, with some difficulty in explaining why a huge migration program continues. A society that was very anxious, it would be the simplest thing to do. We've just heard Henry say, you know, there's, politicians can make hay with this issue. But no mainstream politician is saying we should cut back uh, our migration. The only, the only people sort of in the mainstream doing that are the Greens for environmental uh, reasons. The part I agree with may be that um, Australians have a, a deep memory or, or fear of being invaded from Asia. But just as paranoid sometimes do have real enemies, I think situated as we are, it is not good for the world at large or for the people in our part of the world to come to the view that you can just sail here and be accepted. I mean, we could run an immigration program that way, and some people have seriously suggested it. Put up some hurdles, still make it illegal, but anyone who comes here and passes is OK. And as they did that, we would cut down the quota that we set every year, 12,000 for refugees, you know, 180,000 skilled uh, and whatever. We could run a migration program that way. And the people who say these are only a few who are coming to the border seem really to be envisaging that. 
because of course if we allowed people just to come more would follow we are told you know how many Tamils there are they could all come and that may no may not be a bad thing but then the whole way we did migration would be different and I think the people who misunderstand that are putting at great risk the whole migration program and Paul Kelly in his recent book says this very clearly there's a sort of compact between the Australian people they might may not particularly want mass immigration and that doesn't make them unusual they accept it on condition that the government's in charge of it and when they see the government losing control, that's when you see this high passion, which many commentators put down as racism. But if that was so, you can't explain so much else about modern Australia, the things I've highlighted and the things that Judy has highlighted. But the point is that in the 1970s, the Labor Party, had it chose to make that a very big issue with Malcolm Fraser's government, then probably they could have scored enormous political benefit by frightening the Australians about the arrival of the Vietnamese. And they didn't, because there was still that bipartisan support. And now that broke down under Howard. And I think it was bro broken down deliberately. I think there's more continuity, Henry, uh, even over the Vietnamese than you allow, because certainly to his great credit, uh, Fraser let uh, the people in but he worked furiously as Rudd is now doing to stop them coming and the end of the story is that the people later in the queue just rotted in uh, migration detention centres in Thailand, Malaysia or wherever so Fraser was generous and I think for the reason Henry said I think he felt some uh, obligation because of our part in the war but I don't think you'll get a Prime Minister and fortunately now we've seen Keating, Howard and Rudd operate in this way so people now can give up the fantasy that we're going to get a Prime Minister who says boats can come and we should welcome them you're never going to get that um, my question is directed towards the second speaker John Hurst um, you said uh, that in Australia all forms of racism are outlawed and closely policed. Um, do you think that policing is effective in stopping racist behaviour given the subversive and often private nature of racism and the uncontrollable reality of everyday interactions between um, different types of Australians? And I'll, I'll give a brief metaphor if I could. Um, <laughs> In Australia, all forms of speeding are outlawed and closely policed, but is it not true that most of us still exceed the speed limit regularly? Yes, well, Speak as Judy for yourself. Said, <laughs> as Judy said, uh, there is a limit on what governments can do, but we are fortunate to live in, in a society where uh, officialdom, both in formal institutions like law and human rights and equal opportunity commissions and so on, is very definitely uh, anti-racist um, and that those bodies have real bite. So really blatant stuff uh, can come under public scrutiny. Of course there are going to be informal racial feelings, expressions, uh, behaviour which is hard for governments to control. Um, it's controlled by uh, an official culture that is, every primary school kid is drilled in anti-racist uh, behaviour. We aren't telling children to hate other people at school, which happens in some societies when they do history. The very reverse happens uh, in Australia. And though I've, I'm stressing Australians' reluctance to accept migrants, uh, the reasons we did, I agree with uh, Gassan, it was instrumental. We didn't bring them because we liked them because we want to build up our population, which I think is one reason for the success of the scheme. I've been stressing that, but I think in time, as Judy's work shows, Australians have now internalised this achievement. And so very widespread in the society is the sense that we've got something valuable and that it behoves us all uh, to protect it. And we watch ourselves, as Judy reports, we watch ourselves. So we don't let you know, our worries and anxieties get out of hand. So what more can be done? I think when there's blatant uh, 
racial behaviour, that's attacked and people go to court for it. And I think that's pretty good. We could do better. But I think we're set up to go on doing well. OK. Uh, well, my question was particularly to Henry, but I guess anyone can field it if they want, uh, around what uh, great, well, most of the speakers brought up, uh, the concept of structural racism, the way that, you know, it's not about people's individual ideas, whether people are more or less racist in the population, but about uh, things embedded in either policy or the structure of the country and so on, and the way they see that playing through today, because I would have thought, for instance, uh, the Northern Territory intervention, the way that seems to be the same content with a different form as all the other uh, attempts to drive Aboriginal people off the land and so on, and even to a great extent the treatment of international students and many of the, the public demonstrations in the city around uh, racism there. A lot of people at those were drawing the links with uh, government policy and the way students are treated as this being a thing pushed from the top. So I was hoping if some of the speakers could elaborate more on what they meant by structural racism and the instances they see that in today or in that today. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, yes, take, sorry, let's take questions. another question. And can yeah. I just say, I think probably after the next two, that will be, you know, that'll take up our time from the floor to allow a bit of response here. So it's good that we've got the queue there, but maybe not any more in the queue before we see if we've got time. But please. Hi, my name's Walter Phillips. I used to teach history here and teach uh, my students the things that Henry Reynolds and John Hurst were talking about. And sometimes I had students of non-Anglo uh, background, if we can talk like that, who felt a little superior that they weren't part of the uh, original theft. But I told them they were the beneficiaries of it, just as the rest of us are. But what I want to tell you is, I, the, the other day I read an article in a magazine, The Spectator Australia, Britain No Longer Racist. This was written by an Asian who'd gone to... Britain at the age of seven, uh, but he had got on quite well in British society, and he was making the point that now in Britain you'll see at the, at the upper echelons people who are white, brown or black, and you will also see people at the bottom of the heap who are white, brown or black. And what he was arguing is what prevents equality of opportunity in British society today is not race, but culture. And he finished up his article by saying, it's not the colour of your skin that makes a difference to your position in society, but the cut of your jib. Now what I'm asking really is, are we moving toward a position like that in Australia? I realise that the question of uh, the Aboriginal people uh, creates a, a different element from British society. But I was uh, tremendously interested and stimulated by this article. Well, I mean, just in terms of the culture race issue, I think there's, you know, there's this uh, theorist, uh, Etienne Balibar, who recently said racism no longer exists and never has there been more racism. And uh, what he meant by that is that if you stick to a very sort of like traditional concept of race and racism, I mean, uh, it doesn't exist anymore that much. I mean, the idea that some people believe that they are part of a race that is scientifically sort of like uh, uh, proven that I belong to the white race and they're scientifically proven to belong to and uh, that hierarchy of race, this idea is a phrase that we associate with scientific racism that emerged. Yeah, it's a very tiny minority of people who would take it uh, seriously. But at the same time, if you are looking at cultures of demeaning people on the basis of their identity, uh, if you're looking at, uh, I mean, one important issue today is that often racism is associated with inferiorizing people and extermination. And it's a very interesting triangle because uh, from an anthropological classifi classification mode, it doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, we humans don't exterminate 
what we consider inferior. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that I consider inferior without wanting to exterminate them, including people with some political persuasions. Uh, but uh, we exterminate threats. And, and what constitutes a threat such that I classify a threat as needing extermination. And so, so if you look at something like Cronulla riots, and you don't want to look at whether the people who were racializing the Lebanese on the beach had a racial conception of the Lebanese. It's enough that they essentialize their identity, demean them, consider them a threat of some sort or another, and that's a good everyday racism. Do, I, I was just going to say about um, two, two things, the stru structural racism, right, I mean, I think about it, is it seems to me it's either in, has to be embedded in the practices of the state, and we've talked about that, but there can also, be, you know, I think, be structural racism where embedded in other non-state institutions there is perhaps informal discrimination against people of, of different races, and that becomes then an empirical question, and I didn't, you know, and, and there may be in some areas like stockbroking firms, but not in other areas, you know, generally... Um, so that, that is how I sort of understand structural racism, that there are, there are processes perhaps of, of informal discrimination embedded in institutions. Um, on Walter's question, I think that, I mean, I read that article and um, I think it was raising a whole range of questions which have really got to do with, uh, I suppose, where I ended up with my paper, to do with um, cultural forms that are associated with particular ethnic groups and, 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 the, and modernity, actually, and, and the ways in which uh, people from different immigrant groups, sometimes some of whom have... Because that, that, that article was written by um, a, um, an, an Indian South Asian who was busily explaining how the Pakistanis weren't doing very well because of various aspects of their cultural practice. So, you know, I think that, that you know, people are coming from many different societies with many different sort of cultural forms and that th that's what the interesting questions are and that that in a way race has become too crude a category really for people to think about I think that it doesn't really it doesn't ha it doesn't have explanatory power at a theoretical level and I don't think it has a lot of explanatory power for a lot of people in their everyday lives but it, the sort of thing we got were people for example there were some people we interviewed in Shepherd and who were talking about the Iraqis. And what would upset them about the Iraqis was actually to do with... Um, this was in, it was a man working on a building site. It was to do with their treatment of animals. They would go on and on about, you know, them throwing... They had goats into concrete pores. Now, I don't know whether they did throw goats into concrete pores, but this was what was being reported and, and also the ways in which animals were slaughtered because we interviewed somebody who worked at an abattoir's. So they were actually very specific things which had much more, I think, to do with issues around modernity than anything to do with race. Uh, yes, if I, if I could come in briefly. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm rather surprised this idea that Britain, one, it's uh, far more class-bound than even Australia. It is far more unequal. It still has uh, an hereditary aristocracy who I think are largely British, English, uh, and it has a, a, an active political uh, anti-migrant, anti-black movement, far more so than Australia. So it's a rather, uh, I haven't read the article, but it seems rather a, a distorted view of, of modern Britain. Um, it, it, to some extent, what I'm going to say uh, reflects what Judy had just said. One of the most important ways in which Aborigines were treated and viewed wasn't just race, but rather development. They were backward, they were Stone Age people. Now, that idea of stages of development is still profoundly there, and this is more than anything what affects the situation. And the basic question, I think, the fundamental question is whether Australia wants there to be a continuing people the Aboriginal people who may have quite different culture and we have to accept that. 
Now that may not, may not be what Aboriginal people choose, but if they do choose that, uh, that's what we'd have to accept. And that is where there is structural uh, attitudes which are profoundly important. That is, their practices are primitive. And they need to join us and get modern. No, Pearson often sounds like that, doesn't he? He does. <laughs> he, he's a Lutheran pastor. <laughs> Can we perhaps have the last two questions and then that will uh, give time for, for the exchanges here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question's a little bit different. Um, Gassan Hajj mentioned that, well, you know, in Australia we're obviously um, living on stolen land, that, like, that Australia, uh, its economy and its, it as a nation uh, is based on theft. Um, the second speaker, I don't remember your name, said some, uh, something along the lines of, um, you know, oh, we, well, we know that the government can't, or people can't expect the government to be able to uh, just fix um, inequalities in race. But of course, we know in the current contest that actually it's more than the government not doing enough, but that the government actively imposes racist legislation, such as we've seen in the Northern Territory. So I suppose in that context, um, you know, like uh, Gassan mentioned, well, we're all complicit in. Uh, the theft of Aboriginal land, and I suppose that includes the continued theft and dispossession from Aboriginal people. So like, what is it that you propose we do to break from that complicity? Because for me, I think it's about uh, fighting alongside our brothers and you know, our Aboriginal brothers and sisters who you know, make demands of the government, who ask, you know, protest for an end to the Northern Territory intervention, who ask for land rights, who ask for community funding, all these things. So for me, the way to break with that complicity is to support Aboriginal people uh, in their demands. But I wonder what like, you think we should do? But uh, with regard, I'm never good at these questions of what we should do. I'm much better at getting stuck into people. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, really, I think at the same time, when, when, especially with regards to indigenous questions, when people say, what do you think you should do? One should always be aware that Australia has no shortage of people with goodwill, who want to do things and who knows the thing much more than I do, as they are trying to do uh, things. So what I'm interested in is, that's why I'm, I'm interested in the culture in which things are done. Uh, and I'm interested in the fact that when people say, for instance, like I, I, I remember when we were long time ago now we were having a discussion about the viability of an indigenous tax and uh, the idea that everyone should, should pay an indigenous tax and the tax should go to indigenous people. So and it's not a donation, so it's not a... Then of course the question of, uh, well, can you imagine who, which body is going to receive the tax and who will have the the know-how to uh, blah, blah. And then this idea that, well, can indigenous people form a kind of like body that can uh, help them to... Uh, and in a sense, I would be happy with people who say, well, at one level, it's none of our business. Uh, this idea of worrying, about whether indigenous people will waste the money or uh, what have you. At one level, I'm saying it's full of contradictions, but at one level, I, I, feel, I feel there isn't all the interventions are about making indigenous people part of society. Uh, but there isn't a sense where, what about the right of mucking it up? <laughs> I mean, the right, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in this, in this right to be bad, the right to mucking it up today, because this is how I perceive, uh, actually, uh, Cronulla. You see, a lot of people who attacked the racists, 
in Cronulla were going on about how wonderful the lab boys on the beach were. And oh, something along this line. Well, I mean, I've done a lot of field work in this, among these boys, and I've never thought they were lovely. Uh, they were seriously not nice, actually. And uh, I would be quite happy to challenge the fact that they're not nice. But at the same time, I would not like to challenge the fact that they're not nice by making it a national question and a question of their national belonging. That is, they have no monopoly over sexism and macho modalities. They are sexist, they engage in macho, and uh, they're physically violent, all of these things. But they have no monopoly over that in Australia. And they can be that without having their Australianness challenged. I mean, one of the things that struck me was that a lot of people who were worried about East Lebanese actually integrating were seriously hypocrite because what really worried them was that the East Lebanese boys on the beach were really over-integrated. <laughs> it was it was really about how dare you so be such a pain and so different and feel so comfy on the beach. <laughs> how dare you feel so at home? Can't you be shy a bit, for God's sake? <laughs> this, this was really sort of like the, the, the... And to my mind, this idea, the right to muck it up, the right to be bad, the right of the other, sort of like is an integral part of how we can start conceiving of a relation with otherness in which we are not valorizing them because we want them to be either culturally or economically productive in our national garden. Um, my question is for Judith and um, John Hurst. Judith, I just want to ask you, um, you said that you found in your research that there's um, individualism um, and uh, people tend not to group people in stereotypical sort of racist ideas, then how do you explain um, Pauline Hanson and John Howard and people like Andrew Bolt and Alan Jones who are su so successful um, and uh, who sort of, I mean, Kevin Rudd now is saying that he um, won't bow to emotional blackmail of the refugees, who use this as political... Um, leverage who use it to um, further their political ends or sort of their, their journalistic ends. Um, and my question to John Hurst was, um, do you think that the inferiority of Aboriginal hygiene is responsible for the 20-year gap in um, life expectancy between um, or like Australians and first Australians? And I also want to say that um, I'm Tamil. I'm a Tamil Australian, and I want to ask you about human rights and whether you think border security and the idea that if you let some in, a whole lot more will come, um, that argument stands up in sort of the basic human um, characteristic of helping people who are desperate, who have nothing but the clothes on their back and the boat beneath their feet. Um, can we say to them this just, like, this is our border security, we can't let you in, it doesn't matter if you have nothing. And also about Australia's responsibility internationally towards taking refugees, um, how can we say that we won't take refugees and sort of, then who will? Will Indonesia have to take them? Will, um, I know Italy has about 35,000 people who, who um, who are refugees, and Australia, because of its geographic location, doesn't have borders with another country. So, like, uh, how, where does Australia stand in that responsibility in terms of refugees? Thank you. The point, the, I think the big point I'd want to make is that I believe in the autonomy of the political. That is, I've never, I don't believe that countries get the politicians they deserve. I, that is, and I don't think that politicians' views are somehow a direct reflection or expression of what of, of what people think. And in fact, one of the things that was really striking with our interviews is the extent to which people distanced politicians and, and their own views from that. 
So um, that being said, people are, there are plenty, it was clear that people had anxieties about a lot of issues and so it's quite clear that, that these anxieties can be mobilised and whipped up. What we, I suppose I was interested in was the way when, in a, in a reasonably calm situation, people um, tried to calm their anxieties down. So that's not to say that politicians don't have the capacity to actually arouse the anxieties and in, in, in some ways inflame them. I also think people think different things at different times. One of the, an interesting article that I read uh, many years ago on McCarthyism in the United States um, by Daniel Bell, no, it was like Richard Hofstadter. It's called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And it basically asked this question about how sometimes America would get whipped up into a sort of phase of paranoia and then it would subside and then it would come up again. And there is a sense in which there are, that politicians do have a capacity to manipulate, I think, anxieties. But it doesn't mean that people aren't also, don't, that there aren't also other capacities there, which I guess was the point that I was trying to make. I think, John, you were fingered. Yes, I was asked but... about uh, Aboriginal health. Yes, I think in part the reason why Aboriginal health is inferior to the rest of the population is that they don't fully believe in Western medicine, which comes as a result of their being Aboriginal. And that's a dilemma. It's not the whole explanation, of course. Uh, why Aborigines uh, are living in a degraded way takes us to the whole history of um, exploitation and uh, oppression. But the point I was trying to make is people who simple-mindedly think that Aboriginal health is as it is because we are not doing enough. That's, that's just wrong. It's much harder uh, than that. Um, on refugees, we do take refugees. The question was, why don't we take refugees? We are not taking uh, the people who are presently uh, in Indonesia, but we do take refugees. We take 12 or 13,000 a year. And on international terms, given the size of our population, that is quite a good record. If you want Australia to take more, you argue at that point. You say we take 180,000 for skill, why can't we double the refugee? It's, it's a greater cost, because with refugees we may or may not get people who are ready to participate in Australian society, which has got harder because English language and skill are now much more important than they were in the 1940s uh, or 1950s. Uh, the point which you know, I've made several times is uh, Australia is committed to taking refugees but not taking those who happen uh, to show up. And though I see the compassion in people who are worried about um, the Tamils at the moment, and it is heart-wrenching uh, to see them, people seem to lack imagination. They are not imagining two things. One, all the other people in sordid refugee camps around the world who are applying and coming to Australia, and the more we take by people just showing up, the government lowers uh, the number of the refugee intake. Perhaps they shouldn't, but that's the present policy, and if you disagree with it, that's where the argument should be, not that Australian people are racist. And the other lack of imagination is, and I've already said this, is if you allow people to come freely by boat, there will be lots of people coming freely by boat. So the question doesn't depend on the quality of the people we now see in the leaky boats. They may all be good people and all genuinely refugees. But Australia has decided that that's not the way we're going to do but this John, business. The, the problem with that, if I can just come in there, is we have infinitely more people who arrive uh, illegally by plane. Right. And we don't worry about them. And now is that because they can afford the cost of the fare or because so many of them are white? No, I think it's because it's something we can keep control of. How? Oh. I think it's uh, not visible. I actually think no, because it's not visible. Well, maybe that, but it's something you can... can Ten times control. more people arrive illegally by plane. Well, they don't arrive illegally, do they? No. They overstay their That's visas. Right. They overstay their visas. No, they come on tourist visas and then ask for yes. refugee status. Yes. Yes. But, I mean, that's a far larger uh, movement of people than the few people who get to Australia by boat. Why, is, why is it that we treat the boat people so differently? Uh, that's a paradox, a, well, a I mystery. Mean, well, it may, it's better to talk, speak of it as a mystery, sure. But Rather than, but, we but, but we're going to have to wind up in a minute because the the session ends and a lot of people are going to go. But please, if you perhaps I should say a last go at anything that's either following on or uh, a last word on any of this. Oh well, I was just going to say I think it's actually because of what Howard did with the Tampa. I think that he somehow 
politicise things. That um, David Maher had a really good article in the weekend papers, which was just he said that either there's, that there's some deep-seated anxiety, he was arguing about people on boats. It seems to me that it was open for political leadership to actually um, behave differently in relationship to the Tampa, and if that had happened, we would be in a different position now in relationship to the, um, the Tamils. There'd be a lot more people coming by that route, but which may be okay. You, but you it's may the, it's choose the, that. It's the, the, it's the invisibility of the people arriving by plane, and they provide. There's no political crisis that 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 is involved. They're, they're dealt with individually. Nobody's ever seen. They don't get into the media. We barely know about them. I think this is going to go on the fisty cuffs behind when we go out of here. This is clearly we've started something here. I, I would really like to say this has been the most interesting and. Um, uh, generous presentations by the panels. This is a, a, a very um, a, a hot topic, an important topic, and to have a group of people talking as, as wise and uh, knowledgeable as we've had talking about this is a, is a real privilege. And the questions were terrific because it clearly led to a very interesting discussion. So thank you for the people who uh, presented questions. But I would like to very formally, um, well, not very formally, in an Australian way, uh, thank our participants, uh, Gassan Haj, Judy Brett, John Hurst, and Henry Reynolds for uh, immaculately prepared presentations. Uh, there was no waffle, no piffle, uh, each stating a very clear position uh, and the terrific de debate that ensued as a result. So perhaps you'd join me in thanking them. Thank you.